Simon Faggart, and it is definitely a mouthful. Um, so, wow. There is a lot of amazing collaborative work happening out there, and some serious leaders already working in this space and doing some amazing habitat restoration projects. And while these are all amazing and very good, we've identified a few key barriers that can take good to great and grow this into a more scalable and large scale restoration. So what we have as our different barriers is uncertainty in methodology. So how do we measure habitat impacts and improvements? Second, unclear benefits. What do I get out of doing this? What are the benefits? And third, red tape can be within local government or within organizations. Getting the job done is pretty difficult. However, what I think is a common challenge meant met amongst many organizations is funding. However, we think we may have a solution. So, um, could you put your hand up if you took an airplane to get here? Okay. Now, could you please stand up if you carbon offset your flight? <laughs> that's good, that's good that it's you too. <laughs> so, carbon offsetting is basically a way for businesses to balance the emissions from a plane or a factory or whatever through environmental projects. Now this is seen by planting trees or through rehabilitation. But the opportunity for the seafood industry is that this goes back to the habitat, habitat restoration projects that our team was discussing earlier and actually helps to improve the resource, but also takes those funds from that $3 that you paid extra to offset your flight and can help grow the resource so that we have a more thriving, and, um, thriving industry and thriving habitats to help them grow the resource. So, it's, blue carbon is also different to green carbon, which is terrestrial. So looking at the different habitats, you see mangroves, tidal marshes, salt seagrasses, and coral reefs, which are all the breeding grounds for fish species, and basically the basis of our industry. And we've been seeing some amazing companies taking blue plunge, already taking this initiative. So in my role at Marine Stewardship Council, I have the luxury of working with lots of businesses all throughout the supply chain that are at the forefront of sustainability. And Austral Fisheries is probably one of the most well-respected businesses in Australia in that space. So in 2016, Austral announced that they would be the first ever seafood business to be 100% carbon neutral, offsetting 32,000 tons of carbon in their first year, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> Additionally, Sydney Fish Market is in the process of developing their new facility, and they've committed to making the new facility 100% carbon neutral as well. So if you think about, for the seafood industry, it makes a full circle loop of those funds being able to come back in and help the habitat resources to grow our resource, which is basically all of our livelihoods. But it doesn't stop at the seafood sector. Qantas is an amazing partner here in the offsetting world. Um, so Qantas is the world's largest offsetter, offsetting airline, offsetting 585,000 flights a year, which is one flight every 53 seconds. So if you can imagine that this funding allows for new opportunities to help grow these habitat restoration projects into a bigger and bigger opportunity for the seafood industry. So now I'd like to invite John Ford to come up and present our vision for how this could be achieved. Thanks, Mary. Look, I'm going to bring you back to where we started. I'm going to bring you back to our vision of a united and empowered seafood community. A seafood community that is thriving from the benefits of habitat restoration. So thriving from the benefits of having a bigger resource, but also thriving from the benefits of working together to get there. Now we've learned that every sector has a role to play, and that they have much to gain from working together on this. 
If we could overcome the challenges that we've identified, and we could build a project that involved all these sectors, that provided benefits, that was funded, what might that look like? And I'm going to build that for you. We've got the coast, a bay, something around Australia. At the moment, habitat is looking pretty grim. Um, what if we could get back some of these habitats? Over here, we have um, mangroves here on the, on the left. The mangroves may be able to support an indigenous mud crab fishery. We can restore seagrass over here, attracting fish back, getting fish production in that seagrass, supporting a commercial fishery. We could have salt marshes up the top here on the right, which act as filtration and, and give that give that license for aquaculture to develop in these areas. We have oyster reefs down here at the bottom, which provide um, a great resource for, for snapper, like Bob Pierce in, in Port Phillip Bay, wanting to get those snapper back and provide, that, provide those fishing opportunities. And all this is also providing amenity. This is a healthier marine environment. So we're getting birds coming back to seagrass beds. We're getting, more ha we're getting an environment that people want to be in increasing tourism. We have more seafood in this area. We have a greater, greater um, diversity and, uh, and a fresh seafood which to buy, which attracts people into this area. But kind of one of the things we found out is that even though all these groups certainly see, can get benefit out of habitat restoration, they probably don't have the capacity to fund these large projects. And that's where blue carbon can come in, in carbon offsetting but not just carbon offsetting. We can also look at habitat offsets, which allow development in certain areas where we may see the loss of current habitat. But if you can offset that habitat restoration in other areas, hopefully more than what was lost, then we can actually see a net gain. Nutrient offsets from water treatment, sewage plants, a lot of these industries um, and these, these, these are needing some sort of social license to be able to continue to put nutrients into our coastal environments. If they can rebuild habitats that can filter that out, then that may be a great opportunity. So this is the kind of thing we'd love to see, all the sectors working together in habitat restoration. Now I'm going to pass back to Meredith to finish up and tell you what we need to get here. Thank you, John. So, what is needed? So first, we need a commitment. A commitment for, from all of you, that is a collaboration. We also need this commitment to be time-bound, so that it can be measured against our progress as we move forward. Second, we need a commitment, we need investment in science. So blue carbon methodology is still not 100% finalized. There's not a proper standard for it in Australia. So therefore, it makes it for businesses hard to verify their, what they're actually doing. Uh, second, we also need research, continued habitat research, uh, to monitor habitat improvement projects. And third, we need an inventory of, pro of projects. So this can help to progress the records of past projects and help with key learnings, and as well as to see where projects are at in the development stage that are in the process. And the third part of that is provide opportun new opportunities. So what's been identified by current investors is that a lot of time is spent going out and looking for projects that are going to be feasible. So if there's one collective area where you can go and find things to make things a bit easier and for the seafood industry to connect and unify. And fourth, and incredibly important as well, is education and communication. So this needs to be within the industry to help create that ownership and stewardship of our industry, as well as in the public. So I think over the past six months in this leadership program, we've all really learned that our industry is incredibly passionate and also incredibly diverse. And that's a great thing. But when it comes to speaking as an industry, we need to have that unified voice to be stronger and more efficient in the future. So, we have a challenge for you. 
So as a challenge, we'd like to see that by 2030, 100% of Australia's seafood sector to be carbon neutral, offset by blue carbon habitat restoration. <coughs> um, so our group is committed to helping with the next cohort of NSILP 2018 to help mentor them into this project and to be part of developing this repository of upcoming projects. Uh, so to wrap it up, we want to say thank you so much to all of our valued partners that gave us information and a listening ear to help you <coughs> to get here, and we look forward to building a better blue future together. Thank you, and we'll invite the C-Tube team to come up and present now. <laughs>